effort in our sorry. sorry it's more sorry. no you're fine it's more obvious how it's been more pervasive in latin america just because of the ways in which they discovered you know the new world they called it the new world which is what we call america the entire continent today but sometimes with africa it's not as obvious because christianity was in africa well before many uh european hegemonic christianity was there so we have the ethiopian church and we have other different churches in north africa that were developing earlier than you know any roman empire took over which mm. is what a lot of people hold on to to say that africa's christianity is not um uh oppressive but we know that a lot of african countries that we call countries today by power of dominion and by power of colonization were colonized in because of christianity and because of course of other things but a lot of the We'll focus on Christianity. And I love to say that Christianity can be both. It can be a weapon of oppression, mm -hmm. but it can also be a tool for liberation. Uh, and also it can be something that you don't engage at all. Like you don't have to be a Christian. This idea that we have to be Christians is a, a hegemonic idea. And uh, there is a characteristic of white supremacy that is homogeneity. I Sometimes I say things in a weird way way but homogeneity uh teaches us that we all have to be the same way and white supremacy teaches that white supremacy says that we all have to behave like white europeans behave that we all have to understand the world like they understood the world that our marriages and our relationships with our children our relationships with our family extended family has to be um has to look the same way that europeans look we have to dress how they told us to dress we have to behave how they told us to behave and christianity has played a huge role in making that expectation of homogeneous society uh so something that we all consider a good thing so that's why we see families and we think about this idea of the nuclear family as a mom a healthy family in our brains is a mom a dad and a couple of children but that is not there is no evidence before be, be, before that assertion. There is no evidence at all. There are healthy people that come from divorced parents. There are healthy people that come from single parents. There are healthy people that were raised by their grandparents. Health is not, you know, uh, health is not co constrained by the ideologies of one way of being. And hegemonic Christianity has taught us that we all have to be Christians, that we all have to be in certain families, that we all have to be heterosexuals, that we all have to be. But the world is a lot bigger than that. And our ways of existing are a lot bigger than that. And it is really bizarre to believe that there is a divinity, whatever you believe about divinity, you know, but to believe that there is a divinity out there that demands that we all fit into very narrow boxes of existing and being. And those boxes just happen to align magically, happen to align with the way that European, white European Christians have chosen to be in the world. And so this reclaiming of Christianity or reclaiming really of religion, reclaiming of spirituality means reconnecting. There is this word in Hebrew called emet. The word emet means uh, truth, but truth, the word emet in Hebrew is three letters. And it's the first letter of the, of the alphabet, of the Hebrew alphabet, the last letter of the Hebrew alphabet, and the letter in the middle of the Hebrew alphabet. And the Hebrew language is a little bit different uh, than English or Spanish for that matter. Uh, in English or Spanish, we have words and then we have meanings to words. But in Hebrew, we have letters and the letters have meanings. And the connection of the meanings of the letters make up the meaning of the word. So the meaning of these letters is really a remembering. Truth is remembering. Truth is all of the things that can we can look at through the beginning, the end, and the middle. It's a journey. Truth is a journey. So truth is really never objective inside of these ancient Hebrew ideologies of what truth means. Truth is not objective, but it's really subjective. It's a story of you. It's a story of a people. So the truth of the Christian, you know, uh, people is not the story of what's happening with Christianity right now, but it's a story of how Christianity began, what is happening with it right now, and what is happening in the future. And beyond that, it's the story of what's happened to you and Christianity. Because the truth about Christianity for Kansi or for me or for, you know, anybody else is very different for each of us. And no, your truth is not diminished by mine. 
you know, they just happen to coexist together. But Christian hegemonic power says that the truth is objective. An objective truth has to be found inside of the way in which they interpret the Bible, people in power, they meaning people in power. And that is oppressive in itself, because then your story, my story, our truths, our emits, then are reduced to what can fit into what they has told us has fit, has to fit. And so there is this, you know, the movement here in the U.S. a lot uh, called Land Back here in the U.S. and in Canada. And Land Back is a movement that began with indigenous people that said, we want the land back. And in the capitalistic mindset of Americans and Canadians, uh, what they heard is, we want you to give us the land, like to give us a title to the land. And indigenous people are like, no, nobody owns the land. What we want is to be able to continue to treat the land how we treated it for millennia before you got here. What we want is to be able to be in communion with the land like we used to be in communion in the land before capitalism. Well, there is a similar movement with the spirituality. When we say we want our spiritualities back, when we say we want to remember and we want to have Christianity or spirituality in general as a tool of liberation, we are not saying that Christianity overall has to be what we say Christianity is. We are not saying that people have to submit to what we say Christianity is or what we say spirituality is. Instead, it's an invitation to reconnect with these very ancestral ways of being that are within us. And so I started studying neuroscience and neurobiology, and I started learning about epigenetics and how there is basically, your, our nervous system is incredibly with wise and vast and it has been evolving since humanity began um and our nervous system is picking up information all the time without our conscious prompting so all the time my nervous system is picking up information for people that are oppressed is picking up the information that we are not safe for women of color particularly more so for black women the information that we're hearing all the time is you are not safe be aware be conscious don't show up fully as yourself because they are going to tell you to just tone it down, bring it down. Don't be a not Christian or against Christianity because you will be murdered. And this information that is stored in our bodies is passed down generationally. Uh, it's passed down genetically for people. So my ancestors that were murdered by Christian colonizers that came from Spain, the fear of Christian uh, oppression and the fear of Christian submission was stored in their bodies, but and it was passed down to me. Uh, but the wisdom of their ancestral ways was also stored in their bodies and passed down to me. And we have access to that information. And we, as we start healing and reconnecting with our um, nervous system, and we are not in this fight flight mode all the time. We are not all the time responding to the environment, but instead considering ways. And there is a lot of privilege in saying that because some people have no option but to respond to the environment. But if we can find pockets of safety where we can reconnect with our with the ancestral wisdom that is within us, be it Christianity or something else, which I found for me, it was both a mix of Christianity and other things. If we have if we find enough safe spaces, because we cannot heal if we don't have safety. And safest spaces are found within us and then with other people. So places like the table are places where people can have can have the safety to be able to explore. What does it look like if Christianity is not safe for me? Can, can I say that? Can I say that it's not safe for me? Can I say that I'm not interested in it? Can I say that perhaps I am not sure about my sexuality here? Can I say that perhaps... Um, you know, I like, I don't like the Bible. I don't want to open the Bible. I've had people that tell me all the time, like, I don't want to read the Bible anymore. And I'm like, okay. And they're like, oh, that's okay with you. Cause I'm a pastor. I'm an ordained pastor. And I'm like, of course that's okay with me. Like there are so many avenues of wisdom. And I, I wrote a tweet today, coincidentally, I wasn't thinking about this, but it connects with these where wisdom is, we've been told that wisdom is knowing of God. Wisdom is, you know, the fear of the Lord. That's what the Proverbs say, but we don't understand what that means in the Christian mindset and also in Westernized spirituality, because what we hear is wisdom is the fear of whoever is above us. You see, it's, it's, um, it's what I call predatory teachings, predatory teachings that make us, we're picking up information with our nervous system. 
And we are told that fear of the Lord and who is the Lord? Well, the authority is above you, right? And so it works really well for us to be like, oh, wisdom is being afraid of our parents, being afraid of our pastors, being afraid of the government, being afraid of our spouses, sometimes if we are women. Um, but really, wisdom is enduring good judgment, enduring good judgment, being able to make good decisions, being able to engage with difficult situations, with good judgment, being able to have solutions and have wise conversations with people, being able to navigate conflict with other people. So wisdom is enduring good judgment. That's what I want for my kids, right? That's what I want for the people I love. That's what I want for me. That at the end of my life, I can say, if you look throughout my life, I made good judgment calls. I made good judgment decisions. I raised my children with good judgment. But if we look at the history of Christianity in the West, and especially with marginalized peoples in Nigeria, in Africa, in uh, Southeast Asia, in Latin America, you don't see enduring good judgment. In fact, the church has to show up over and over and over again to give us half apologies that are not real apologies to say, oh, we missed it there. So they had certain stances on clergy marrying and then they changed that and then with a lot of other denominations clergy could or could not marry depending but they changed their mind they had a lot of ideas about divorce and that changed they had a lot of ideas about parenting and that changed they had a lot of ideas about judaism that have changed historically and are still problematic um but if we want good judgment and our spirituality is an avenue to give us wisdom, because that's what spirituality is all about. It's about wisdom and our spirituality is an avenue to gain wisdom. Then how can we find spaces in the world? How can we find and create spaces in the world where people can explore different ways of being and find enduring good judgment, find wisdom without feeling like they are going to be penalized or abused because they are exploring different ways of being. Uh, I don't know who the ancestral people, the different ancestral peoples of Nigeria are, but I'm sure that all Nigerians have a deep uh, connection to ancestral ways of being. And where are safe spaces when we can, where we can create uh, 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 communities where exploring that is safe? Where exploring, what does it look like? You, you know, like I found out that one of my grandparents was an indigenous um, healer, which Christians call them uh, witch. You know, he was he was considered a witch man, uh, but he was a healer. And what he did is he used a lot of different plants. And he used a lot of different like seeds and things like that. And he would make concoctions for people so that they would heal. And so I found out that he would use, uh, there is a lot of eucalyptus where I grew up in, in like the plains of the high mountain plains of Colombia. There is a lot of eucalyptus. And he used a lot of eucalyptus because people got a lot of like got colds a lot. And he used eucalyptus. Today, we know that eucalyptus has a lot of very good properties that help people that have colds that they help your respiratory system so he wasn't a witch man he was using all of these different plants to be able to offer healing tools for people that were found on the you know around them and that was my one of my great great grandparents um and so it makes sense because I love healthy foods and I read a lot about different ways of eating and I read a lot about plants and I use essential oils and all of these things and it was being sold to me as these uh, like white women here in the U.S. sell oils right now and they tell you that you have to do all of these things and it was being sold to me as holistic like health by white women and it just felt so off for me uh, but I was interested in it and I was like why am I so interested in all of these things if it just feels off and then I started reading about my ancestors and I was like, oh, because that's what they did, but not in a colonized, I'm trying to sell you something because these white women were trying to sell me oils. Um, they are, it's not that they are trying to sell me oils for $75 a little bottle, but instead it's that I have this connection, like these things are calling me. Uh, and so I started doing research independently and finding independent ways of, you know, connecting with all of these, but I needed to be safe to do that. Uh, and inside of you know, evangelical Christian hegemonic spaces, I could not say my grandpa was a witch man and I am proud of that. And I want to reconnect with that part of my, um, of, of my legacy of my, you know, it's something that my ancestors left behind for me. And so you'll see me putting garlic on my children's food when they are sick, because I know what garlic will do for them. Uh, but it's not out of witchcraft, but it's out of 
reconnecting with ancestral ways of being and it's spiritual because we've inside of christianity the division between the spiritual and the secular exists but inside of judaism or inside of our ancestral ways of being there is no division between spiritual and secular we are spiritual beings therefore existing means that there is a spiritual component to our existence that doesn't have to be the truth for everybody but in our ancestral ways of being there was no division. So secular was an invention of hegemonic Christianity to call everything that wasn't Christian secular. But secularity doesn't exist. We're just human beings that have different aspects of existing. And some of those aspects include spiritual our spirituality. And so the only way that we can disrupt um, hegemonic practices and using spirituality as a tool of, I'm sorry, as a weapon of oppression over a tool of uh, liberation is to become the tool of liberation. It's to become the tool of liberation and therefore become safe spaces where people can say, these are questions that I have, or these, I, these are things that I'm struggling with and they can feel safe in our spaces. That's why I call everything that I do the living room because being in my life is being in a living room with me where you can ask any questions, take off your shoes, kick up your shoes into like the couch. I never sit straight. Like somehow I'm always sitting like my legs are up. I don't know why I have an inability to sit straight. So I tell people like, you can sit however you feel comfortable in my life. And that's also a metaphor to you can be whoever you are in my life too. You can explore whatever you need to explore. You can ask any questions. And so long as your beliefs do not cause harm to others. So I'm not okay with racist beliefs. I'm not okay with homophobic beliefs. I'm not okay with anti-Semitic or you know, Islamophobic beliefs. And I will challenge those and will navigate that conflict. But if your beliefs about yourself, your ancestors, your ways of being, your ways of connecting with the earth around you and the community that you are surrounded by are different than mine and don't harm anybody, I honor them. And I actually believe that I can learn a lot from them, uh, which was my experience. I ended up in Turkey for um, a, an extended amount of time with my family, spending a lot of time with Syrian refugees that are all Muslim. And they were sharing with me their spiritual ways of being and existing. And I learned so much. I, I didn't convert into Islam. I wasn't interested in converting into Islam and I'm still not interested in converting to Islam. And yet I have a lot of respect for Islam because of the things that I have learned from Muslim people and the things that I learned from them without having to convert. That's That can exist too. You can learn from other ways of being. And sometimes those ways of being will call you into exploring further, which has happened with me and Judaism. But sometimes it'll be like, I learned a lot from Islam. It's not for me. And that's fine. And I honor the parts that I learned. So the question that I like to leave people with is knowing that Emmet truth is really subjective, knowing that truth or, you know, understanding that the way that we can understand truth is Emmet as, as subjective, as moving through history, as not something that happens right here, right now, but something that we have to look over time, something that requires for us to understand the complexities of a people's story and of individual stories, what would it look like to respect and honor and make a room and space for places where uh, plurality is celebrated and homogeneity, homogeneity, that's really hard to say in English, homogeneity is not something that we are pressuring people to fit into, but instead we celebrate plurality, we learn from plurality, we are excited about plurality, and we know that there is unique and a specific wisdom, right? Like good ways of engaging the world, like good judgment for engaging the world. There is a specific wisdom that is hidden inside of the DNA of each one of us because our ancestors have left it, whether wisdom to keep us safe or wisdom to continue to exist in the world and, and flourish as the people that we are. How do we make room for people to explore the wisdom within them and share it with us? And how do we make room to explore our own wisdom? where there is fear because of the colonization that we've experienced, because of the oppressive ideologies that we've been indoctrinated into. What does it look like to give room and make room and make space to be safe, to explore the wisdom in others and in ourselves, to create pluralistic communities where all people are welcome and all people feel safe? So I'll stop there and make room for some 
comments or we can have conversation if that's okay. I don't I don't know what how long you want me to talk to for. Thank you. Yeah, I was going to say if anyone wants to jump in and has comments or questions, we can go right into it and then continue the conversation in a QA sort of style. And yes, then people can, because I, I know that some people probably already have questions. So feel free to type up your questions if you don't feel like um, speaking and we can read them out or you can just unmute yourself and feel free to talk. Yeah. I have Hi, questions Joe. and stuff, but I don't want to start. So let someone else start. <laughs> yeah, I, I think I'm taking a lead here. I don't know. For some reason, she said something that caught my attention and um, she was talking about how she she mixes or they mix, uh, they mix um, Christianity with other form of spirituality and that's the way they approach their spirituality. And I say, I think my question would be, what do you say to people or Christians that feel like, oh no, you can't be a Christian and mix this with that. You have to be a full 100% Christian, so to speak. Um, I guess that's my question, yeah. Yeah, Thank you. I get I get that all the time. <laughs> I'm told I'm not a Christian all the time. And uh, a few things, the, the Christianity has not agreed on anything for the last 2000 years that it has existed. There has been no agreement about anything but two things. Christians agree about two things. One, that there is a God, but they don't agree what that God is, what that God looks like, who he, who he is, or if it's a he. They, some Christians believe that it's a trinity. Some Christians believe that there is no trinity. So Christians agree that there is a God, but there is no agreement on what it means that there is a God. And then the other agreement they have is that Jesus was important, but they don't agree on what the importance of Jesus was about. They don't agree on whether he was divine or not. They don't agree on whether he literally resurrected or not. And agreements have existed for always if you read the gnostic um different uh, like gnostic books of the first and second century they didn't believe that jesus was good. so there is so much disagreement that the books of the bible the canon of the bible are still in disagreement so you have the protestant books and then you have the catholic books and then you have the eastern orthodox books and then you have the books of the ethiopian churches and so you have a different like Ethiopian, I believe that the Ethiopian canon is 88 books as opposed to the 66 books of Protestants. So there is really no agreement about what it means to be a Christian. Uh, the only thing that all Christians agree is that Christians follow the Christ, but they don't agree on what the Christ is. So my understanding of the Christ is the divine within me. I believe that Jesus was the Christ, but I don't believe that the Christ is limited to Jesus. It means that there is a consciousness, a reality uh, that makes you the Christ. And Christ is the divinity within you, the most authentic version of yourself, living according to how you were created to be. That's what being the Christ is for me. And so I follow the Christ. And in following the Christ, I've moved away from hegemonic Christianity. And if you think about Jesus, the more he followed the Christ, the more that he moved away from hegemonic powers and the more that he challenged the powers that be, mostly the Roman Empire ideologies that were seeping into Judaism. So people tell me all the time that I'm not a Christian and I tell them, you know what, they believe that Jesus wasn't a Jew sometimes and they believe that Martin Luther wasn't a Christian and he was excommunicated from the church and most of you idolize Martin Luther. They believe that a lot of people that were martyrs of the church by the church, because the people that have killed the most, Christian, the most Christians in history are Christians, most martyrs of the church today that are like they were heroes of the faith were martyred by Christians because they were told that they were not Christians. They were considered heretics. So sometimes it happens to be a compliment when people that use Christianity in ways that are hegemonic and cause harm, it's a compliment to be told that I'm not a Christian. And I say that to them and they don't like it either, but that's okay. We are I have learned that if we are going to stand against oppressive powers, we are going to be told that we are not things and we are going to be told that we don't belong. And we have to remember that at the end of the day, we belong to ourselves more than anybody else. That's something that Maya Angelou taught me, that if we don't belong to ourselves, we don't belong anywhere else. We are just seeking for belonging, but changing who we are to fit into the narratives that they have in our head about us. Uh, and we can't do that. That's betraying the Christ within you. You know, maiming yourself, cutting parts of yourself to fit into what somebody else says you should be to be able to be accepted is this is it's antichrist because that's not who you are. That's who they want you to be. And so 
they'll tell you that. And what does it mean to not be a Christian? It means you don't accept me as a Christian. And that's fine. You don't have to accept me as a Christian. But their opinion of our spirituality is quite honestly irrelevant. What matters is the opinion of ourselves, you know, the relationship we have ourselves with divinity and the opinion of our immediate community, these pluralistic communities. Are we harming you? Are we causing harm? Are we causing abuse? No. Cool. Then we keep on moving forward. And if we are a Christian, then nobody can take that away from you. Um, I was I was invited into Judaism. It was the most beautiful. No, but Jews no, don't proselytize. Uh, but I was talking to my friends. I have a lot of Jewish friends and I live in a very Jewish community. And I was saying that I love Judaism. You know, it's it's beautiful. It's taught me so much. I've learned so much from Judaism and from learning Hebrew. And she told me, she said, you do know that you have a, a Jewish soul. And I was like, I don't know what that means. And she said, well, in Judaism, we don't convert people because we believe that souls have belonging. And Jewish people will always come back home, whether in death or during life. They'll always find their way home because your soul belongs. Your soul simply belongs. There's nothing you can do to stop being a Jew. There's nothing you can do, even if you're never a Jew or in life. If your soul belongs to Judaism, your soul belongs to Judaism and you and I are siblings. And I thought, what a beautiful approach to religion. Imagine if we approach Christianity the same way. And I do. I approach Christianity the same way. If you belong to the Christ, there is nothing anybody can do to take that away from you. Because what power does a human have to take divinity away from something that is inside of my DNA, from something that is inside of my spirit and soul? There is nothing that they can do, nothing. And I have fought with the Christ and with the Bible and with God, divinity, more than these people will ever understand. I've fought with it because I've wanted to leave it and I can't, I can't. It keeps throwing me back. It keeps calling to me. Christianity, religion, spirituality, Judaism, it keeps calling to me. And so, yeah, they'll believe I'm not a Christian. And yet it's a part of my makeup. It's a part of who I am. It's a part of my being. And that might not be the truth in the future because we change and evolve and, you know, but I, I feel like it will be. Uh, but even if it isn't, I am right now. That's my truth right now. And that's a truth that nobody can separate me from because the Bible says it, right? Nobody can separate us from the love of Christ. So how can a human try, you know? So, but it, it doesn't, it, and I don't want to diminish the reality that those words hurt sometimes, depending on who they are coming from. They hurt. And sometimes I say that. It hurts me when you say that. It makes me feel like you don't want me to belong unless I fit into the idea that you have of me. And you're asking me to betray myself for the purpose of belonging to you. And that hurts me because that means that you don't love me. You love the version of me that you have in your head. But that's not me. You either love me as I am or you're demanding that I fit into the boxes that you've made for me. And that's not love. That's coercion and that's abuse. So. I, I want to validate that it's hurtful because of that reason, you know, but nobody can say that you are not a Christian because we are. Thank you so much for that fantastic answer you gave. Because honestly, it'd be, it be the people that are very close to you. Like I'm also a pastor kid and I relate so much with Orion Kamsi. I just don't, I'm not the loud one, but mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I know how I go through, went through my own process as well. I mean, the, comp the composing and the, the, what's the word again please help me because i'm struggling here anyways um you get the gist constructing um, yeah deconstructing thank you so okay. i'm i think one more question before i go i feel like this is falling under the scandalous question so to speak so the question is like um can you be an active like can you be an active sex worker and a christian at the same time i mean depends on who you ask um but in my opinion yes uh, there is no ethical consumption inside of capitalism. There is no ethical consumption. All of us are selling something. All of us are hurting somebody with our consumption. I remember when I learned about the, I love chocolate. That was not emphatic enough. I love chocolate. Like I love chocolate. And I decided to research about chocolate and the ethical practices inside of chocolate and unethical practices. Most chocolate that we get in the U.S. is unethically made. Uh, children in Africa are being exploited in order for Americans to be able to eat cheap chocolate. Uh, there is a lot of slave labor in the making of chocolate, like modern day slave labor. And a lot of them are underage children. A lot of them are adults, but it's a slave labor nonetheless. So every time we buy chocolate here in the U.S., we are participating in that. 
um, the people, that, the, the CEOs, the people that are working in their Hershey's companies, the people that are working in Nestle, the people that are working in all of those places are participating. They are selling their time to participate in the slave trade of chocolate, like in the slave labor that chocolate demands. Uh, and then you're trading your time. You know, the people, people here work a ridiculous amount of time. Like I know people here that work 90 hours a day, 90 hours a week, 90 hours a week, like working all the time, selling their body, their health, their well-being in order to be able to pay for a car. Um, and inside of such oppressive capitalistic ideologies and capitalistic beings, somebody that has to or chooses to um, sell their body to be able to survive, he, the problem is the system. The problem is not the person. Uh, it is more problematic for me, the, the billionaires that are making people work for $5 an hour, $6 an hour, that don't give them breaks to be able to go to the bathroom, which happens with Amazon, while Jeff Bezos is worth $134 billion. Uh, to me, Jeff Bezos is much more problematic than a sex worker that is trying to pay the bills, you know? We, we all are making decisions to pay the bills that are harming somebody else or that we don't ethically agree with. Uh, I don't have to ethically agree with the jobs that other people have to make so long as they are not causing harm. Sex workers are not causing harm for anybody. Sex workers are mostly being harmed because we have a very horrible idea of sex workers. We've dehumanized them collectively and we see them as less than human. And if you look at many of the... Um, uh, what is that called? The people that murder more than one person? I forgot the name. Serial well, killers. Serial killers. If you look at a lot of serial killers, they target sex workers because societally we don't care. Because if they were killing white rich women, they would be able to kill one. And then the world would stop. Uh, and we would make sure that they don't do it again. But they kill sex workers because we societally don't care enough especially if they are trans sex workers. And so it's the dehumanizing of women, the dehumanizing of sex workers, what's the problem? But sex work is not the problem. Sex work is work. And all work inside of capitalism is problematic. All of it, like all of it. And we have to survive, you know? We're all shoved into it and demanded to survive it. Um, I, I have more problems with some pastors that exploit congregants for their job. I have more issue with with a lot of pastors that tell people that they have to serve in their churches for hours and hours for free and not get paid uh, in order to please a God than with a sex worker that is trying to survive and not exploiting anybody. So, but that's my opinion. That's totally a matter of opinion. Thank you so um, much again. Thank you. Thank you. Have an echo. It's like you're very, you know, divine. Like your voice booms through. <laughs> um, or do you want to go next? Or should I read out? There are some questions in the chat. Should I read those out? Oh, yeah, you can read that one first and then I'll go after. Okay, awesome. So the first question I see here is from Carolina, and um, they say, hello, could you please repeat what you mentioned about the word for truth in Hebrew and its definition? Yeah, the word for, um, I can actually, uh, uh, Kamsi, I can do this too. I, I will send you an email with some it written, because it's a lot easier to explain. Uh, but the word is emet, E-M-E-T, that's the transliteration in English. Um, the word is emet, three letters, the first letter, the middle letter, and the last letter of the Hebrew alphabet. And it's, the meaning, as I said, is complicated, but it basically means a journey uh, of observance, like a journey of remembering. It's what's happening to you. It's subjective. It's not objective. So truth is this word emet, um, that it cannot, like English fails short in explaining it because it, it basically means the beginning the middle and the end of a story, all of the story. Like a truth is not just the beginning. A truth is not right now, but a truth is a journey of experiencing things. This next question is from Shogo and it says, how do you handle conflicting ideas in your journey? 
uh, I sit with them. I So I started this practice that is journaling. And I was already doing that when I was inside of evangelical Christianity. I already journaled. But the journaling was a lot of like repetition of this is what I have to believe. And, you know, uh, and then I started journaling and saying, I'm going to give myself permission to journal and, and put all of the conflicting thoughts out in paper. Uh, like say them out loud. Just acknowledge that I have these conflicting beliefs and ideas inside of me. Acknowledge that I am uncomfortable with a lot of things. And one of the first things was I was reading about trans issues and I was like, I don't get it. Like, I don't get it. How could you, if you're born a woman, you're born a woman. That's it. That's, that, that was my, my brain could only handle that much at the time. And I remember, but I remember being so afraid of saying that out loud. So I started journaling, like, what does it mean to be a woman? Like, because then I realized I don't even know what it means to be a woman. What does it mean to be a woman? And I started journaling through all of that and I realized that I don't, I actually don't identify as a woman per se. I am non-binary. Uh, but it was a journey of studying and reading and giving myself permission to say things out loud that I wouldn't. And sometimes I felt safe to say them to some people in my life. But sometimes the only safety that I could find was my journal. I only felt safe writing it out loud. There is something that happens in your brain when you put something in paper or when you say it out loud or when you have the language to be able to explain it there is a level of actual healing that happens in your brain your your neuro your neurons fire in a different way when you're able to put it in paper or to say it out loud uh to acknowledge it to make it conscious uh and you you experience a, a a different pathway in your brain and something starts literally physically biologically changing in your brain I didn't know that at the time, but then I learned that. Uh, and so writing it down and finding safe spaces to be able to explore those without judgment for myself. Um, you know, like, was I transphobic? Yes. But I was holding no judgment for myself because my transphobic beliefs were but handed down to me. I didn't have better tools. I didn't know any better. Uh, but now that I had better tools, I needed to know better. So I was going to learn more and read more. So I was holding no judgment for myself, but... No, I wa I didn't want to hold on to the idea that I'm a good person. That's that's also a characteristic of white supremacy, the idea that we are good people. We're not. We're 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 humans. We are flawed, messy. There is a lot of conflicting beliefs. Our nervous system wants to protect us, and sometimes the desire to protect us is going to make us cause harm to others. So, realizing that I don't have to prove that I'm good, that I don't have to hold on to the idea that I'm good, but instead I want to hold on to the idea that I'm human and complex and evolving and learning. I gave, I created space for me to be able to say the conflicting things that I was believing. And if that was just my journal, then it was my journal. But if I could find somebody that I was like, can you explain this to me? Because I'm really confused. Then that was it. And now I've, become, I've tried to become that safe place for other people. So I have a lot of people like my dad, for instance, he was like, I don't understand anything. I need you to sit down. So we started meeting once a month and having dinner. And he would ask all of these questions. He was like, I don't understand. What's the big deal with feminism? I'm a feminist. I think women should have the same rights. And I was like, okay, well, that's not the extent of feminism so we started and he's like but I mean the me too movement like not all women have been abused and I was like let me talk to you about that and I said that do you know when was the first time that I was sexually assaulted and he was like well, you've been sexually assaulted and I was like most women have but do you know when was the first time that I was sexually assaulted and he was like no I didn't even know you were assaulted and I was like I was 11 years old I got off the bus from school and some boys that were older grabbed my butt and they laughed. And when I told my mom, she was like, that happens. I'm so sorry, honey. Ignore them. Because she didn't have better tools either. And what would you have told me? And he was like, I would have been angry, but I probably would have told you the same thing. Uh, and I was like, that's sexual assault that we've normalized for women. So when we say me too, what we're saying, being a feminist means that's unacceptable. Nobody's going around touching men without their consent. Uh, you know, other men, but women are not going around touching men without their consent. That's not a common thing, but it's a common experience for women. So what does it look like to raise children that don't tolerate that and to give them the tools to say that is absolutely unacceptable? And for those boys not to laugh, but to say to their pal, you cannot do that to other women. It's absolutely unacceptable. And so, but my dad was blown. He was like, I had never considered any of that. So what is it? But he said, I could have never talked to anybody about that because I felt ashamed of not knowing more. And I didn't know what I didn't know. So 
finding places that are safe, one, and then being honest with yourself, having the courage to say, I believe really problematic things, having the courage to say, I don't know that. I, and I've acted like I do. Like we all have acted like we know Judaism because we read the Old Testament, which is not the same as the Hebrew Bible. But, you know, having the courage to say I'm ignorant in this regard, having the courage to say I've, I'm holding on to really problematic beliefs that I, and I want to know why. What's the fear there of letting them go? So I handle them by having courage. And sometimes I acknowledge I don't have the courage to do it. It's too, it, it makes me afraid. And so I put it on pause and I say, this is not something that I want to engage yet, but I have to come back to it at some point. Um, but yeah, I, I hope that answers. I went all over the place. Um, thank you so much for that. Yeah, or I'll let you go before reading the next question because that was the order in which things came in. Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you, Joe. This has been... It's like everything you say is really seeping into my veins and the conversation about finding wisdom in your body is something I've been exploring recently. Um, just knowing that there's a lot of information that your body holds and you know when you stay in your body there's a lot that you can learn about yourself and about the world. Um, so I have a couple of questions in, in that line. So one one of the questions or is the same question just rephrased in dif in different ways it says in what ways do you respond to the divine within you how do you you know glean that wisdom or, be, or in, basically what practices what yeah. have you faced in your life as a person individually to help you just connect with the divine in you yeah um i learned that because of trauma uh trauma changes your brain and trauma, the best definition, most simple definition of trauma that I found, it was a white man, so I'm not going to give him credit. Um, I'm kidding. <laughs> uh, what's his name? I, I actually forgot his name. Oh, Mastin Kim. His name is Mastin Kim. But the most, um, he gave a really simple definition of trauma that I really like and I've hold on to, which is loss of safety. Every time that your body feels a loss of safety, you are experiencing a level of trauma. The levels of trauma are varying and it can be complex trauma or it can be, you know, whatever. But for different people groups, the level of trauma that we experience is much higher than for other people groups. How safe are black women in the world? How many spaces of safety do black women have in the world? How many spaces of safety do trans black women have in the world? How many spaces of safety do non-span, non-English, like English is not my first language, non-English women of color in the world? So that means that you have a lot of trauma, you know, that you store in your body. And when you have all of this trauma that you're storing in your body, you learn to respond to that trauma by keeping yourself safe. And so I had to start asking myself, is what I want to do a response to trauma, a response to the reality that I'm not safe in the world? Or is it really what I want to do? So for instance, one of the examples that is perhaps one of the biggest things that I did in my life out of trauma was getting married. I didn't want to get married. I never wanted to get married. Growing up, I remember telling my mother, I don't want to get married. I never want to get married. It sounds like a really bad idea. I don't want to. And I was, my mom was like, all little girls want to get married and want a wedding. I never dreamt of a wedding. I never pictured myself wearing a white dress. I didn't care about getting married, but I got married because I was told that I had to, because all of the programming societally and from Christianity was like, you have to be married. You have to get married. Uh, it's expected. Like you, your life cannot be good unless you are married, especially for women. Your life cannot be good unless you are married. So I got married. He's a cool guy. He's nice. We're actually right now going through a divorce, a good, healthy divorce. We both agreed, like, we don't want to be married. We want to be friends. Um, but I was making the decision that everybody thought was a healthy, good, wise decision. He's a great guy. I liked him. He liked me. It's fine. But it was a decision out of trauma, not out of my, like what I wanted to do with my life, what I wanted to do, where I wanted to engage. And I realized that connecting with your body, connecting with your ancestral wisdom requires a lot of trauma work, requires a lot of saying, what are decisions that I make out of trauma, which is fine. Making this, like there is no judgment in that either. Staying safe is important. Uh, but eventually we have to create enough safety so that we start making decisions out of real wisdom, the real wisdom that is within us and not the trauma that is telling us to stay safe. So that trauma keeps you from being able to make decisions out of wisdom. 
because you're afraid all the time that your decision is going to lead to violence. And that's information that is also stored in your body. So you have to be very inquisitive about what's going on inside of me. And there is funny, not interestingly enough, there is science behind this. Um, they say that it takes you about five times of asking why before you can get to the real deep meaning of why you want to do something. So that's, you know, psych psychologists. And, but all of that is ancestral indigenous wisdom of all of our peoples that were like, but what's the real meaning? And I like to call it the hidden motivations. What are the hidden motivations of the things that you're you're going through, the things that you want to do, the ways that you want to engage? What are the hidden motivations? And I remember when I sat with my husband and I told him, I don't, I, I don't dislike you. It's, I don't dislike you. I love you. And I do. I love him so much, but I don't want to be married. I, I don't. So what are we going to do with that, with that reality? What are we going to do with that fact? Are you going, to, are we going to continue to make me be married to you, even though I don't want to be married to you? Or are we going to navigate the reality that I don't want to be married, even though I love you so much, but I don't want to. You know, giving myself permission to say, I don't want to do that. I don't want to be in that job. Do I have to stay in that job because I don't have other ways of paying the bills? Yes. But the truth is, I don't want to. You know, so what is my body telling me? I remember staying inside of the church for way longer than I wanted to because I was told I had to. Until I couldn't deny the fact that I didn't want to anymore. I don't want to. And the problem when we deny our body and we convince our body that it has to do something to stay safe is that we get sick. That's how you get immune, Im, immunodeficient diseases. That's how you, so I got sick. I started getting, I stayed in the church for so long against my wisdom because of trauma that I ended up getting sick and I started getting sick in my stomach. I had to get several surgeries. I started having panic attacks because my body was desperate and my body was telling me, this is not for you. This is not good for you. I know you're trying to stay safe, but you don't want this. How many times do you hear the promptings from within you, your ancestral wisdom, what people call your intuition, what people call the Holy Spirit, what people call, you know, the, 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 your authentic self. There are many different names for it. And you deny it out of trauma because you want to stay safe, but you're killing it long term. And you have to find ways to say, I have to get to a place where I listen to my body. So I'm going through a divorce. I left the church. I, you know, and it's been hard and difficult because in that process, you can hurt people too, that take your decisions as a personal, you know, attack to them. And so you have to navigate all of that. I don't want to hurt. I didn't want to hurt my husband. Uh, and yet I hurt him in that process. And he was like, it hurt me. I took it very personally, but we're good friends. And we are navigating all of these, talking through all of these, trying to become better and better friends. Because if, I told him, if you love me, why would you want me married to you if I don't want to be married to you? Love means that you have to make room for me to expand into what I want. I don't want to be a married woman. I don't. Uh, and it's not because I want to have lovers and none of that. I, I literally, my dream is to have a room that is mine and nobody moves anything around it. And I have four children. That's never going to happen, but still, <laughs> you know what I mean? And so how do we, not betray ourselves for the sake of others and yet relationships and yet recognize that we have a lot of trauma but the truth is that you know what you want you're just not safe enough you know your body your inner wisdom is telling you where to go it's telling you where to move but we are so conditioned by safety by so conditioned by the trauma especially systemic oppressive trauma that we make decisions to stay safe and not to be true to ourselves. Um, thank you. That answer resonates. Like this entire response has been very powerful. I just also would, um, in practice now, what which, do you have any rituals that you practice as a person? Um, for instance, I fi I find myself able to connect with my body during yoga. Um, so I want to know what practices do you have? What practices do you do as a person? Yeah. So I do yoga too. I love yoga. Uh, it's a it's a, an hour a day that I have to be present with my body. You know, that I have to just listen to my body. Like, how is it feeling? How am I doing? I'm not just go, go, go. Um, a journaling is a huge ritual for me. It's a spiritual practice for me. So I journal every morning and it's a, it's a spiritual practice where I 
process what's going on in my life. I process my emotions. I process the things that I'm learning. Uh, I process conflicts through journaling too. So if I have conflict, like with my children, for instance, they are going through something and I don't know how to, like, I don't know how to address it. I don't know how to help them. I don't know how to give them better tools. I journal through it. I was like, how, what would I like? What would I, I just journal through it. Whatever comes into my mind, I just journal. So journaling is very important for me. And then music is really important for me too. So I have playlists for different things. So I have a playlist that is for relaxing and breathing and breath work, breath work. I have a playlist that is for joy and like just I dance a lot, especially with the kids and I have a playlist that is so I try to make a lot of room to put music that because music also uh, changes our body and it changes the way that our uh, brain is functioning. It starts like it opens up parts of the brain music does. Um, so I like to put like I like to play music and I have a specific playlists that are for different things that I need you know like there there are or, or grief too like navigating through grief um there is music that helps me navigate through grief a lot of music just helps me navigate through grief um and the journaling helps me also process emotions like these are the emotions that I'm feeling but I want to process them I don't want to just say I'm sad and move on through my day in, or or medicate my sadness with coffee or with you know going out with friends or with drinks or with whatever I, I want to process my emotions I want to know why am I feeling sad why am I feeling shame sometimes I feel shame why am I feeling shame why am I feeling all of these things and try to explore what's going on within me uh I don't want to just dissociate from emotions and move through life I want to live I want to live my life and that requires processing my emotions which is what journaling helps me with music helps me with yoga is a really good practice for me to be in my body and then fun I really believe that fun and joy are a spiritual practice that is denied to most of us <laughs> so I try to have a lot of fun uh people don't believe that I'm super fun because I'm so serious online uh, or I come off as so serious online, but I'm, I'm very goofy and I'm very silly and I love to have just silly fun. Um, so I, you know, now that I live next to New York city, I go on like fun trips to New York city with my kids. And we, I, we tell them, I tell them to imagine that we are in a, an adventure and that we are trying to escape from whatever bad guy they have in their movies. And we pretend that we are escaping through central park and we take the train and we are like, just, just silly, genuine, silly fun and laughter and nonsense and silliness. Um, because we are so serious all the time and we are told to be so serious. So I just have a lot of fun and silly nonsense with my kids dancing like silly dancing not pretty dancing just silly moving your body and my kids just laugh at everything that I do um but I think that fun and joy are a spiritual practice not to mention they are active resistance against oppression oppression steals the joy from us and I I teach a message on uh pleasure because um, we think of pleasure and sex comes to our head, but I'm not talking about sex. I'm talking about pleasure, all sorts of pleasure and joy and pleasure are very deeply connected together and pleasure leads us to our true selves. And so I create room for pleasure, like food brings me a lot of pleasure. So I eat foods that I love because it brings me pleasure. Dancing brings me pleasure. Uh, spending time with my kids, laughing with them. Yesterday, I spent time with their mom, the moms of my all these daughters friends and all of their friends and we just laughed and played and you know talked about silly things out of pleasure so what does it look like to lean into pleasure because pleasure has been demonized for all of us what does it look like to lean into pleasure what brings you pleasure and how can pleasure lead you uh to to you know spiritual practices that you love for me dancing is a spiritual practice fun and joy are a spiritual practice spending time with people I love that is intentional, intentional, like time where we are looking at each other, talking to each other, uh, which we do often. We have Friday nights that are family nights and we are just spending time together and we rotate who picks the food. So sometimes I have to eat fast food on Friday nights that I hate um, because my kids pick it, but just making, creating practices in our lives to be mindful, to be aware, to be alive, to to experience the fullness of what it means to the fact that we are alive is it's honestly miraculous it's it doesn't make sense the universe is huge and here we are in this little tiny dot alive experiencing emotions conscious you know being able to create realities with the things that we see in our brain 
we don't have a lot of time. I don't know what's going to happen when I die, but I do know that I want to spend this time here and now searching for fun and joy and pleasure and goodness and, and abolition and for people to be able to have more access to fun and pleasure and goodness too. Thank you so much for your response. Okay, I'm going to... Can I... Hi, I can, you... sorry. can I quickly ask a question? Um, just a follow up on, um, on the body question already asked. Um, I think why she was talking something like um, a part of the Bible where you know people can quote against you or something. I want to argue with you that your body might not be a good like spiritual guide, so to speak. Um, um, what would you like? How would you say to approach when someone you know says to you like, okay, the part of the Bible that talks about the flesh and the spirit, the things of the flesh and things of the spirit, and they're yeah. telling you that your body is your flesh and you know. Uh, it, it's not a good uh, indicator of the things of the spirit. So how do you approach such a like narrow situation, I mean, corny situation? So to speak? Yeah, well, that's messy because that is actually an ideology that started in the fourth century. Uh, it started with Augustine of Hippo and he wrote a book that was called The City of God. It, was a, it wasn't a book, it's more a collection of books. And in this book about the city of God, he makes a kind of a... Co co he makes a correlation between what's the city of God and the city of the world. And he basically starts talking about how our bodies are simple. So he believed that uh, this is not in the Bible. This is just, he created this imagery in his head. Nobody knows from where, but he became, a, he was a really popular uh, theologian that a lot of theologians agreed with. And he believed that um, when Adam and Eve ate of the garden of, of the fruit of the garden of Eden, of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, he believed that they were ethereal beings, that they weren't like physical, fleshly beings, but they were ethereal. And when they ate, they became, they created a body. They had a body. And that part of the sinful nature of humans is that we have this body and that our body is naturally sinful. There is no empirical evidence of that. There is no biological evidence of that. Um, there is no even theological evidence of that being a belief even before uh, Christianity. Some people said similar things before Augustine, all Christians, but before Christianity, there is none of that. But more importantly, uh, even if that were true, the reality is that we're here with our bodies and our bodies are not evil. Because the problem with that ideology is that also create ableist ideologies of bodies that are not perfect are even you know, more in sin. Uh, and what is a perfect body, by the way? Uh, and so fat phobia comes from all of that. And so to believe that our body is sinful is actually to ask us to be dissociated from our body. And dissociation is a psychological uh, problem. It's a, it's, a, it's a maladaptive coping mechanism. Uh, it's a way of not living your life because of trauma. So dissociation from your body causes you to not experience your life, causes you to be distanced from your body, distanced from your life, and simply continue to do what you are expected to do by the people that are telling you to do it. It actually leaves you vulnerable to abuse. It leaves you vulnerable to be an abused person, to be a victim of abuse. And so the only people that are interested in dissociating someone from their body and telling them that their body's bad and anything that comes from fleshly desire is bad are people that are wanting to control you because dissociated people are easy to control and manipulate uh dissociation causes us to be vulnerable to abuse so that's what i tell them i said hey dissociation it's been it's been proven by psychologists it's been proven by mental health practitioners that dissociation from your body makes you vulnerable to abuse because you don't know what you want what you don't want what you like what you don't like what is okay what's not okay and you have to rely on other people to tell you what is okay and what's not okay instead of helping instead of having the tools to be able to say, this is what I like, this is what I don't like, this is what's good, this is what's not good. Um, all of those things are important for you to know because the human experience requires a body. And if it requires a body, it requires a good relationship with your body. And a good relationship with your body requires that you acknowledge that you have desires, that you have hunger, that you have sexual desire, that you have you know thirst, that you have to move to another place, that you hate heat. And so dissociation makes you vulnerable to abuse. Um, that's why we teach it to children so much, you know, like you're not sad. Stop crying. You're not sad. That's teaching them dissociation because they are sad. The only thing that we should say to a child crying is, I understand that you're sad. How can I help you? 
how can I, how can I help you? What's going on? How can I, but telling them you're not sad, you're not, you know, or don't, don't do like that. Don't act like that. Have a good attitude. Why? They don't feel good. <laughs> they don't, you know, we teach children to dissociate. And in teaching children to dissociate, we grow up as adults that are dissociated all the time. And that is a maladaptive coping mechanism for abused people that makes us more, more vulnerable to abuse. It's not a good practice. It's just simply not a good practice. And it's a practice that we're following from a fourth century bishop that had no, like he knew nothing about the human body. He knew, this was all based on his theological opinions because he was, can I, I'm going to, it's a bit, it's going to be crude. So forgive me, but literally he was horny for a non-Christian woman that he left pregnant and he left her to raise the child on her own because he said that he was just giving into his sinful desires because she was a non-Christian and his mom didn't want him to marry her. And so he, trying to understand his own trauma, he came up with this theology that his body was sinful because he couldn't stop wanting her, even though he knew she was bad for him. She wasn't. She was simply a non-Christian. And he came up with this theology. So we cannot follow the theology of a traumatized man that was continuing to deny himself um, we have to follow science. We have to follow what we know about the body. We have to follow neurology. Uh, dissociation is bad and it leaves you vulnerable to abuse. Um, so Faber, Faber has a couple of questions and they've been waiting. And I feel like their next question is a great follow-up to everything you've been speaking about. Their question says, how, how in this new kind of Christianity, how can I approach sense as a single person how can I approach sex as a single person? What guides you when you approach a new person just to have sex or respecting your body or do you save yourself for marriage? So yeah, I feel like that's a great follow-up. You know, that's a, that's, a indiv that's an individual decision. Uh, waiting until you get married is it's a choice that you make, but this is the truth about marriage. Marriage has always been a contract between two men the contract between two men included the exchange of women, like of a woman. Uh, so women were considered uh, property. And in a marriage, part of the contract, a dad would give property to a husband. That's marriage. Marriage today is a contract between a woman, a man, and a government. Uh, but it's a contract. Marriage doesn't change anything about who you are spiritually or in any possible way it's always been a contract um and before it was a contract with the government it was a contract between men anyways the the idea of romantic love and marriage is an idea that started in the 18th century before that marriage was simply out of convenience what is best for these two is it good for these two families to unite yes or no like that was the whole entire deal with marriage uh and in the 18th century uh, in the Victorian era, it started creating this idea of, oh, marriage is love and it's the way that you find love. And that's not true. Some people are married and don't love their spouse ever. Uh, and some people like me adore their spouse and they just don't want to be married. Uh, so the question is, what is healthy sex for you? What is to have a healthy sexual relationship for you? A healthy sexual life, a healthy sexuality? What, is, what does it look like? Uh, does it? If you're married, does it mean that your sexuality is healthy and good? No. Uh, when I was married, and uh, I was, I didn't want to have sex because of all the ideologies that I was putting my, that were putting my head growing up, that sex is bad. And my body shut down. And it was like, I don't want to have sex because I think it's bad. Like my brain, I can't make my brain think that it's not bad just because I said, yes, I do one day. And so the, the sexual relationship that I had with my husband for many years was very unhealthy because the only information I had is you're married. So it's good. Just do it. And so I was having sex against my own will because I was told that I had to, because I was married. That was unhealthy sex, very unhealthy sex. And when we left the church and we were exploring more things, I realized, oh, that's really unhealthy. And he did too, he didn't know. And so I said, I'm not gonna have sex unless I want to have sex. Uh, and he was like, yeah, deal, like, absolutely. And I was like, and I don't know if I'll ever want to. So, you know, like, but I'm not gonna have sex against my own will. That's the definition of abuse, sexual abuse. Uh, and so what does it mean to have healthy sex? 
And healthy sex requires enthusiastic consent. And enthusiastic consent is, I absolutely want to do this. I'm not being coerced. It's not because if I don't do it, then my husband is going to be married. Or if I don't do it, my boss is going to fire me. Or if I don't do it, you know, it's enthusiastic. You want to do it. The other person is enthusiastically wanting to do it too. And you both respect one another as individuals. You both respect one another as people. Uh, it doesn't mean that you are in a, you know, you can have healthy sex with someone that you're not in a committed relationship with. Um, now, then morality comes into place, right? Because there is a thing that is called ethics and then there is morality. Morality are rules and guides that we have for our, ourselves or a group of people. Ethics is harm or no harm. So morality, so ethically speaking, healthy, good sex is respectful amongst two consenting adults, enthusiastically consenting adults. Morality says... Perhaps that's not good for you. Perhaps you need to be in a committed relationship. That's important for you. Uh, for you, it's important that you are in a committed relationship, that you both are committed to each other, be it marriage or be it a very committed, like, you know, boyfriend and girlfriend situation or whatever it is. So you have to ask, what is it that you want out of your relationships? Um, why, why is this important to you? Why do you want to have sex with somebody that you are committed to? Or why do you not? Um, and so... There, there is two aspects of that. The ethics of it is it has to be amongst consenting adults. It doesn't, married, if it doesn't matter if you're married or not married. You have to be consenting and respectful of the other person. And then the aspect of morality, which is your personal values that are different than mine. Doesn't mean that yours are right and mine are wrong. It just simply means they are different. What is your values regarding sex? What is it that you want? What is it that feels good to you? What is it that feels like this is right? It feels like I'm not betraying myself. Uh, and if that means that you want to have sex inside of a, a, a committed relationship, then that's fine. Uh, that is fine for you. It doesn't mean it's fine for everybody else. Some people don't mind uh, if it's not a committed relationship. And fine for them. I, you know, whatever. I'm not the one having sex with them. So... <laughs> Great. So the next, before we jump into the next question, Joe, I just want you to know, like, let us know when you need to leave, because there's so many questions. And if we're not able to get to them, I can just compile that in an email and send it to you and then later get in touch. Oh, but just, yeah, just let us know, because there are quite a few questions in the chat. So I'm just going to keep going through, but just in case you need to leave, just let us know. And I, yeah, I probably have to leave at one. So okay. the one yes. here, so that's in about 10 minutes. Okay. Okay. So I'm going to go through the next Whoa. Can you hear me? Oh, dear, there you go. Hello? Hello? No, no, connect. Connect, connect. Don't do this to me right now, please. 